All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I see we've got a lot of media on the line today, so thank you. I know we have many people watching from home, our residents watching from home and on social media, so thank you very much for being here this afternoon. Uh, for those of you who are new to these news conferences, my name is Crystal. I'm your Cabinet Comms voice, and I'll be facilitating this news conference today. This afternoon, we are here to discuss the uh, release of the Emerging Wisely Plan, which is, outlines the path to eased public health restrictions across the territory. In the room, we have um, Carolyn Cochran, Premier of the Northwest Territories, Diane Tom, Minister of Health and Social Services, Dr. Cami Candola, Chief Public Health Officer, and on the line, I believe we have uh, Carrie Ingram, Chief Inspector of Mines and Operational Health and Safety for the Worker Safety and Compensation Commission. Um, so to begin this afternoon, I'm gonna invite Premier Cochran to provide some opening remarks. Thank you. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, thank you for joining us with Minister Tom and Dr. Candola. As stated, we're here to talk about the release of the emergency Emerging Wisely, the Government of the Northwest Territories plan for emerging from the current public health restrictions. As Premier of the Northwest Territories, I take the duties and responsibility you've entrusted me with very seriously. While I value the health and safety of our residents above all, I'm very sympathetic to just how trying these strict but necessary measures have been for all of us. These past few months have required our government to make many difficult decisions. On one hand, we needed to make sure we did everything possible to keep our people safe. On the other hand, we needed to do our best to protect our economy, personal freedoms, and our way of life. This has not been an easy task but I can't stress enough just how proud I am of our response to date. With only five confirmed cases across the territory and not a single incidence of community spread, so far we've luck luckily been able to contain our vi the virus. But we can't stay in this containment phase forever, which is our highest level of restriction. Responding to the threat of COVID-19 in the Northwest Territories required strong measures and swift action. Because of the actions we took, the, the Northwest Territories is now in a position to start gradually re relaxing the restrictions on our people and on our communities. The gradual approach that Dr. Candola is announcing today will help get, our, get the NWT and its economy moving again while continuing to protect the health of our residents. As Dr. Condola determines it is safe, she will begin to relax some of the current measures, including measures dealing with indoor and outdoor gatherings and business closures. This doesn't mean that there won't still be limits on the size of gatherings or how many people can be inside a business, but it does mean that some of the limits will be loosened up. It's important to remember that the threat of COVID-19 is not gone, and unfortunately, it won't be gone for quite some time. COVID-19 is still spreading in Canada and could still threaten the Northwest Territories. Relaxing our public health limits means taking a calculated but manageable risk for our territory. We will mitigate this risk by keeping our border control strong and by increasing our testing capacity so we can respond to any new cases quickly and effectively. I'd like to take a moment to commend Dr. Condola once again for all the incredible work she's done to protect the people of the Northwest Territories. We all owe her and her team a huge debt of gratitude. Lastly, I'd like to recognize the diligence and patience the public has demonstrated during these stressful times. We're in containment because people have respected the orders of Dr. Candola and have done the right thing for themselves, their communities, and their loved ones. And I can't thank each of you enough for that. We will continue to rely on you to do your part in managing the spread of COVID-19 in the Northwest Territories by following the plan that we are, we are releasing today. With that, I'll pass it over to my colleague, Minister Tom. Minister Tom. Thank you, Premier. Our health response to COVID-19 began before the virus made it to our territory. Our actions were early and aggressive to protect our families, 
our friends, and our communities. Our health system remains stable and is adding additional capacity. We have avoided community spread, which could threaten our most vulnerable. We are in containment because of the care and collective actions of our residents, who made significant sacrifices to follow the orders necessary to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. And today, after a vigorous evidence-based process led by Dr. Kendola and her team, we have the roadmap to emerge safely, gradually and wisely from the public health measures currently in place and bring some stability back to our lives. Businesses will be able to open, friends and family will be able to visit, and some of you and your favorite activities will come back. If all goes according to plan, we could see our first relax easing of restrictions within a week. We are confident these restrictions may begin to be eased within the next week or so when the necessary legal orders are finalized and as long as our situation remains stable with no community spread. But I need to be very clear, this is not a return to business as usual and it won't be until this pandemic has run its course. Many of the restrictions will remain in place for the foreseeable future so that we can stay strong and healthy for the long haul. For example, travel in the territory will remain restricted and is still not recommended at this time. If you do have to leave for a family emergency, you will need to self-isolate when you return. And until there is a vaccine, we must keep physical distance of two meters, wash your hands more than we ever have, wear non-medical masks in crowded spaces, and keep our most vulnerable safe. A comprehensive communication plan is being rolled out to keep residents informed about the phases and what that means for businesses, for families, and for individuals. Residents will see graphics and videos on their newsfeed and television screens, hear radio spots in our official languages, and receive regular updates from us as we move through the phases. And businesses and organizations will get the help they need to adapt their businesses. <coughs> take advantage of these eased restrictions. Guidance will be provided on recommenda recommended cleaning practices, the physical changes, and new equipment that may be required in order to safely serve their clients. We must also understand that this is a global pandemic and is not going away anytime soon. We will need to remain mindful that we that use caution and care as the current restrictions are lifted. We will get more cases. We may end up with community spread and meet those challenges. We may need to reintroduce restrictions and ask that you take some sacrifices again. We can't get demoralized if this happens. Fortunately, the last two months of changing how we live, how we work, and how we socialize has shown us that Northerners are prepared to do what it takes to protect our elders, our friends, and family with underlying conditions and children. You will also, you will always have my thanks and appreciation for that cooperation. So as we loosen restrictions, we're counting on you to adapt to circumstances and use your common sense to keep each other safe. We should feel good about where we are, but together we have a long way to go. Stand together while staying apart. I would like, I'd like to now pass it on to Dr. Kendola to go into some of the specifics on this plan. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Tom. <clears throat> this plan is our roadmap to an open society. We called it Merging Wisely because when you're responding to a pandemic of this magnitude, it's essential you are deeply deliberative and base decisions on all the evidence available when looking at easing public health restrictions. My team and I have assessed an incredible number of activities taking place in our territory with the ultimate goal of protecting our people, our health system, and especially our most vulnerable <laughs> residents. Protecting our people, not just from the virus, but from the unintended harms that come for such a rapid change to how we connect with our families and communities. With a team of public health and policy experts, 
We assessed each activity based on how much risk they posed to our people and how that risk could be reduced as much as possible while bringing some freedom and stability back to our lives. Our approach was informed by the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Medicine, public health principles for a phased reopening during COVID-19, as well as the Public Health Agency of Canada's risk assessment frameworks for gradually reopening for communities and for workplaces. Our process for NWT identified five phases. Our current phase, containment, was the most aggressive level of restrictions. This is followed by three phases of gradual easing of restrictions as we reach different phases of the pandemic. The final phase will be the easing of all remaining measures, and this will occur when a vaccine is available or effective treatment is fully implemented. Within each of these phases, we have identified specific activities which can resume with modified requirements based on risk. The plan outlines evidence-based milestones which would make us comfortable in moving forward to the next phase. There may be times when we need to consider stepping back into more restrictive measures, such as clustered outbreaks or breakdown in contact tracing or breaches in compliance leading to wide community spread. We need your help and full community support to help this order work. We have outlined what kind of regional community specific responses could be considered so that localized threats would not affect the territory as a whole. In this plan, we have also set clear lines on what must happen before we ease up. We need to have stronger border security and travel restrictions in place to reduce risk from returning travelers and workers coming into the territory. We need rapid testing equipment set up in the territory to effectively screen and detect the virus. And we will need to maintain our current stats of no travel related cases until May 15th. This would represent two full incubation cycles or 28 days since our last case tested negative with the second swap, and that would be Friday. So as of today, we only have that last condition to meet. This means we could begin moving into phase one of ease measures as early as Friday. Please recognize that this does not mean we are not moving into phase one today, as there is still some work to do for a smoother transmission and we will need amended legal orders in place. So at minimum, if these legal orders are in place, it could be as early as Friday or it could be next week. However, when we are ready for phase one, this is what it will include. There'll be a new recommended model for indoor visiting, which limits your contact to a select group of friends or family. We are calling it the friendship circle. We want you to spend time with the people you care about while keeping that circle small to keep each other safe. Each household can have up to five of the same people they don't live with to come over and be inside their house. A maximum of 10 people, including household members, can be inside the house at any time. We're still strongly recommending that in your household, you keep a circle of friends as small as possible. Maintain physical distance of at least two meters as much as possible and not have anyone else over if you're having someone who's already at risk, like older adults, those who have weak immune systems, or those who have chronic illnesses. In addition, no one who is feeling sick should come over. And if anyone in your household is not feeling well, then people should only visit once everyone's feeling better. We've also shared some good ways to keep that circle small, like keeping to your favorite five, picking one of the house with your best friends or a family you get along with to have over regularly or having each person pick one person to come over and stick into it. Videos, graphics and radio spots are on the way to explain this better to residents. With the right protections in place identified under our risk assessment framework, there are also several other activities we'll be allowing phase one. 
Outdoor get togethers of up to 25 people will be allowed with physical distancing and other measures to protect each other in place. Some outdoor mass gatherings like farmers markets will be allowed to happen with strict limits in place. Elementary, middle and high schools will be able to open up with enhanced disinfections, hand washing, distancing measures and other requ requirements in place. These detailed risk assessments outline these mitigation measures. However, we need to be provided and vetted by our office before school opens. Outdoor activities like beach volleyball, soccer, golf and gun ranges will be able to run as long as they have the right measures to protect those doing them. Territorial park, day use areas, and cook shelters will be able to be used. Community gathering spaces like libraries and indoor fields will be able to open. Some business, businesses once ordered closed will now be able to open with limitations. And these include tourism operators who can offer staycations to locals, museums and art galleries, bottle depots, gym and fitness centers, but just for personal training or outdoor classes and shuttle buses. Clients will also be able to book elective appointments with their chiro chiropractitioners, registered massage therapists, naturopathic doctors, opticians, counselors, and other allied health providers. As long as mitigation measures are put in place to decrease the risk of COVID-19 spread, especially when physical distancing is not feasible. And yes, Finally, this is the most common question that gets asked of me. Yes, you're go going to be able to get your hair and nails done, but there'll be changes to this experience. Has there, be, has there will be for other personal established businesses and activities, just to make sure everyone is safe for both you and the person working. For this to work and to keep each other safe, we cannot let up on the core public health principles these are the ones we've been asking you to follow since the pandemic started. These same principles will ride us through the storm of the pandemic as it surrounds our territory and it will see us through. So these basic principles should be your basic habits and everyone should be practicing them. First, wash your hands for 20 seconds using soap and water or with some locally made alcohol based sanitizer we now have steadily available and do that often. If you cough or sneeze, cover your mouth with a tissue or a flex <coughs> elbow to keep those droplets out of the air. Keep clean and disinfecting high touch surfaces. This includes your cell phones, door handles, light switches. Keep physical distance of two meters from those you don't live with as much as possible. Stay home when you're sick to protect others. If you cannot maintain distance, I would also like to renew a call for using cloth and non-medical masks when you're in public. This is a way we can lower our chances of transmitting COVID-19 significantly. This only works if we all do together. So protect yourself by protecting each other. And finally, I want to recognize the fact that every one of us has achieved something amazing over the past couple of months. With your collective effort, efforts, we've maintained containment for now. That's a chance not many other places around the world have had. So be proud, but stay vigilant because this is far from over and there is still much work to be done and risk we need to avoid to keep each other safe. I have said this before. I believe in the people of the Northwest Territories. We will stay strong and we will stick together and we will be kind to each other. With our collective strength, we will emerge from this safely and wisely. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kendola. Um, thank you again. I see we've got lots of uh, good questions being asked. We've got multiple live streams happening here today. So thank you. Um, you the, for those of you watching online, you will have seen a link being shared. So the, the plan as well as a very helpful in, infographic has been designed to help uh, answer some of the basic questions for this plan and that's been shared. Uh, you can always visit the, the government website as well and that's all on there. Um, so uh, we will get open, we'll open the line for questions from the media. Um, as a reminder on the call to the reporters when you're uh, just please wait for your turn to ask the question. There's a long list of you today 
and I'd ask you to please keep it to one question and one follow up. And should we have um, some time at the end, I'll move, make my way back through the list. As well, again, for those of you watching online, please do not hesitate to ask some questions. We have Mike here in the room with us who will do his best to help answer some of those questions virtually. And then um, when we see some common themes, we'll try and get the uh, experts here in the room to ask answer those questions. So with that, I'm going to open the line up to Mario from Radio Canada. Hi, yes. Um, good uh, Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm, I'm just wondering what's uh, happening with schools. I was uh, seeing in the plan that schools are to be reopened. Uh, I guess my question is maybe for the premier, uh, what's going to happen with that? Since, you know, I, they were supposed to be closed for the rest of the semester, for, for the rest of the season. Um, thank you. So I know, do know that uh, Minister Simpson, who's uh, our Minister of Education, Culture and Employment, has been working very closely with the school bodies. I, they've all been waiting for these uh, orders to come out as well today. So now that the orders are just released, there will be work to be done with it. Dr. Candola did state earlier that um, we're loosening them to schools, but there's still a risk. And so my understanding is that um, we would still have to provide plans to her to make sure that uh, our biggest concern is that our people are safe. We recognize children need to get an education. Um, they need to be around their friends and stuff, but we also need to make sure they're safe. So we're working with the school bodies now. We will be picking up now that the orders are out. And uh, the expectation is that schools that are interested will be putting forward plans as they open up. Thank you. Did you have a follow-up question to that, Mario? Yeah, I, I have a bunch. Um... Uh, I guess uh, so. So, so can we understand that some cool some schools could reopen uh, before the end of the uh, before the end of the the season? We'll let Dr. Candola take that one. So, if you have the emerging um, wisely document in the back, there's an addendum, and in the addendum we go through um, every type of business activity organization, including <coughs> schools. And if you look at the um, mitigation measures, you'll see that um, the schools are self separated into elementary and separated into middle and high school. And there is a significant um, measures that need to be put in place. And those plans have to be s submitted to my office for vetting. And when we review those plans and if those measures are in place, we would approve those plans. What you have to also understand is in NWT, we've been in the unique role. We've done 1,945 tests. We've had five travel-related cases. We've had two full incubation periods to see if we've had any community trans transmission. And we have very strong containment at the border. We also are now ex exiting um, flu season, and we have outdoor weather that's favorable that will allow a lot of activities to occur outside. If there's any favorable time to reopen schools, this is it. Okay, thank you. We're going to just switch it to cabin radio. Ollie, are you on the line? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, if I can just ask uh, about the, the restrictions. So the first question, is there any consideration being given to travel between the Northern Territories if they all manage to stay in the same shape as the Northwest Territories is right now, given that travel to the South is being so heavily restricted? So, um, as a Chief Public Health Officer, I have jurisdiction over the Northwest Territories, but other territories have put in, um, in effect their own restrictions um, to maintain their own territory safe. And so we have not worked as a pan-territorial. We don't haven't worked as a, the three territories in unison. The restrictions um, are specific for Northwest Territories. And if we were to open it up, um, we would have to have all three governments agree. The one um, um, issue around um, the three territories, it, we all have varying degree of capacities. We have varying degree of remote, isolated communities. So the Nunavut cannot afford to take risks that we can in terms of having people self-isolate within the communities because they have limited health capacity. So even though we collaborate and we um, work well together, we share our protocols, um, at some point we make our own decisions for our own territory for the best interest of our own residents. <clears throat> 
I'm going to, Ali, I'm going to let the Premier chime in on that one as well. Um, thank you, Ali. The other thing I can say is absolutely, we are, are focusing on our own borders. Um, however, I have been meeting, um, I think it's weekly, uh, bi-weekly with our, our northern premiers from across the territories. I just met with them today. So they're also at a place where they're wondering about easing their restrictions. We offered to, we did share our plans with them today. Um, you will hear new orders coming out for them as well. Um, it's an interesting concept. I've, I've been really promoting um, stay north, travel north, buy north, uh, spend our money in our territory. But I, I will bring it forward to the premiers and, and talk about that issue. Um, again, Dr. Candola has the, the sole authority over the uh, borders for the Northwest Territory. However, I think it's a conversation that I, I can have with the premiers. Um, not promising anything, but just uh, to have it out there. Thank you for the, for the question. And a follow-up. Thank you very much, Premier. Thank, thank you, Dr. Candola, as well. Yeah, just one more question from me. The the non-essential workers in the NWT, and that's both GNWT workers and just other businesses as well, where staff have headed home because they weren't essential. When should they be expecting to head back to their offices? Excellent question. For the um, GNWT and other non-essential workers. That will be in the second phase. If you look at the pattern um, for phase one and phase two, what you'll notice is a lot of restrictions have been eased for outdoor activities, outdoor gatherings, because the risk is considerably a lot lower than indoor. Um, indoor has been um, restricted um, to where we're having a lot of mass gatherings where people can't physically distance and there's a lot of people in one location. We feel that's better to um, phase in in the second phase because we don't want to reverse all the good uh, milestones we've captured. So we're going to uh, phase in businesses that do one-on-one -on -one clients that can use um, good restrictive mitigation measures that have good access to personal protective equipment. That will be done in phase one. In phase two, we'll start increasing the number of people indoors, but that also will have to have mitigation measures uh, to protect the workers as well. So this is what we'll be planning once phase one is um, initiated, we'll be working on phase two, which is exactly what you have addressed in easing in other uh, non-essential GNWT workers and other private businesses and other uh, scenarios where we have to have more people indoors. Thank you. Just a reminder too to media, um, it's always hard to forget when they're not in the room, but we also have on the line, you'll see his face there, uh, Carrie Ingram from WSCC, so we can always direct some questions there if need be. Um, let's turn it over to Blair Yellowknifer. Yes, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so the the emerging uh, wisely plan, it mentions that the phases can proceed if there's no community spread of COVID-19. But what if there are cases from travel? Um, can the phases still proceed as, uh, as planned? Absolutely. The, absolutely, because um, one of the, what I've always said is we can't prevent COVID from coming in. We're not here to limit COVID introduction. That's why we have strict border measures. What we are doing is putting um, in place measures of tracking, of uh, having people check in, of self-isolation, um, 14 days mandatory, or a workplace risk assessment when they're essential. We put in place these measures so we can better track our travel imported cases. How it has worked in the past is four out of about five cases were picked up for self-isolation plans who had already went into mandatory isolation and we were able to significantly decrease the level of contacts and there were no community spread through this method. So travel imported cases that are adequately um, isolated, assessed, minimal contacts, no community spread is not gonna change uh, or limit our ability to move ahead of phase. A follow up from you, Blair? Yes. Um, so now with uh, schools possibly uh, reopening, um, the, the document says that uh, all masks would, masks would be required. 
Uh, where will the masks come from? Will the government provide them? Um, thank you. So uh, we're just uh, looking at that, of course. Um, some of the requirements for masks will be the uh, homemade ones. Um, so there are programs that we're bringing forward within ITI. Uh, there's $1,000 right now for people that want to do them for manufacturing. We're also looking at a fund for through that infrastructure as well, ITI, um, looking on how we can provide the supplies for people to, uh, to, to make the uh, homemade masks for their friends and families. Um, because that's happening across the territories. I really promote that for people to help each other with that. The actual PPE, the personal protective equipment that might be uh, more medically based will be, we're, we're trying to look at that within the government of the Northwest Territories. We're just deciding right now is that will be, will we be a, a kind of a warehouse gathering for that? It's probably going to happen in all honesty. It is difficult for people to have access to those suppliers. Some of them have never ever had to access those suppliers before. So it's logical since we have the connections that we would actually be a, distribu a distribution base for that. So those are the conversations we're having now, but it's really important and that's why we're working closely with Dr. Candola is that um, it's one thing to loosen the restrictions, but we have to make sure that the businesses that are open have the personal protective equipment that Dr. Candola has uh, asked for. And so our departments on this side are working towards making sure that we have those for people. Okay. Thanks, Blair. Um, I'm gonna go to a question. We were getting a, some of themes online here about travel within the territory. So Dr. Candola, can you talk a little bit about um, people staying within the territory and traveling? Is that permitted? And does that five friends include, for instance, if I have three friends in Hay River, are they permitted in my home in Yellowknife? Mm -hmm. So when we look at my travel order, my travel order is very restricted to NWT borders. I, ha I have no restrictive border within the territories. I do have recommendations. And one of my recommendations is um, to try to avoid non-essential travel, especially to the smaller communities. But if people have friends in Hay River or other parts, there is no order to say they cannot come and travel and visit you. So it's perfectly fine. Okay, thank you for answering that. Um, Francis, CKLB, I know you're waiting for some questions. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay. Um, I guess to keep, do to keep going along the uh, tra travel line of questioning, so I, I wanna make it very clear, Dr. Candola, the plan says outlines overarching orders recommendations to relax the measures and at the top of that list is travel restrictions does that mean that there's no visitors no non-residents other than essential workers that are coming into the nwt first year plus so that's a good question what we're doing right now is um we're looking at the rest of Canada. We're looking at where we're seeing a rise in cases, looking at the cluster outbreaks of community transmission. And this is something we're monitoring every day. At this point in time, it doesn't appear that the number of new cases, the number of deaths have significantly reduced. There is um, a shift where we're seeing less, but it's still, um, it's still at a higher number than when we first um, declared a state of public health emergency. So there is still ongoing risk of travel importation um, outside of NWT, especially down the south. The um, other um, other thing than the rate that we have to watch for is come fall, um, we're going to start to see an increase in respiratory disease. We're going to start to see people going indoors. And we may see um, a lowering or decreased circulation of coronavirus, the novel coronavirus over the summer. Um, but as soon as people start getting indoors, it's going to start to pick up. And right now, we don't know. Uh, we know that typically in pandemics, you have uh, multiple waves. You have a first wave, which we've had in the spring. But people are anticipating that there could be a second wave come fall. Just don't know the magnitude or the intensity of that second wave in the, the southern provinces. Um, we do know that the Prime Minister has cautioned people to ease restrictions slowly and carefully, 
because easing restrictions while you have ongoing community transmission can prove a risk in the fall, we might see um, a significant increase. So if we see a significant increase in um, the number of cases in the south, that will be not the time to relax our travel restrictions. A second question from you, Francis. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure the first one was was answered necessarily, but um, I guess if that is the case, if there are no we we there are no visitors coming, no tourism. Uh, I guess the second question for Premier Cochrane: That industry brings in millions of dollars every year to the NWT. How does your government account for that shortfall for this summer? Um, it's 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 really it's sad what's happened to the tourism industry in the Northwest Territories. It was one of our um, bright stars about uh, diversifying our economy. Many people, over a hundred thousand people, came through Yellowknife, the capital city, in over the last year. Um, so it, it went from flourishing hotels being built, uh, tourists on tours all the time, people walking on our streets, to almost zero overnight. Uh, we're cognitive of that. However, uh, as Dr. Kendall says, we have to be careful. We can't open it up to international travel and even national travel, where the curve is still going rising. Um, from the very beginning, there was talked about uh, uh, leveling the curve, and we're not there. So what we have done, though, is we've heard the industry, just like we brought forward the, the needs of the airlines to the federal government. We're talking with the federal government about our mining industry. We're also talking with the federal government about our tourist uh, industry as well. We know that there will need to be some economic relief with that. Um, and we know it might take some time because uh, there is some fear. We, we have a fear in the communities of uh, pandemics and, and the history in the north of people that have experienced horrible stories with that. So we're supporting them as what much as we can. Uh, again, I know it's not what they want to hear, but uh, supporting tourism local is, is at this point what we're trying to promote and looking for a financial package from the federal government, not only to help the tourism industry, but all of the industries across the north that have had to have horrible stories of having to shut down um, none of us can afford that, especially our smaller businesses. All right, we're going to move on to Charlotte at APTN. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm wondering if uh, within phase one, will there be any changes to the NWT task force as restrictions are loosened? So with our compliance enforcement task force, it only clear, it increases their uh, expansion of their scope of work because they will be um, instrumental in helping investigate complaints around um, the border or self-isolation or other complaints. Um, what we can state is the maximum number of people um, you to invite into household is five with a maximum of ten. So if there are complaints around um, excess of that or mass gatherings or parties, those those complaints will still go on to protect NWT and will still go on to the Compliance Enforcement Task Force. But in addition to this, they will also be monitoring um, other aspects of Phase 1 order in, to ensure that um, people are in compliance with Phase 1. And a follow-up, Charlotte? Uh, yes, thank you. Yeah, I guess I was just wondering if there would be um, more boots on the ground, say more staff hired for uh, the task force than with loosening of restrictions. So maintaining that capacity for our compliance enforcement task force is critical, particularly when we have um, non-essential GNWT workers coming back. And this is um, one of our top priorities, not only for the task force, but for the protect NWT line for border security. So this is um, a priority that's an all government priority and we are um, doing everything possible to uh, maintain and increase capacity we have. Thank, Thank you. you. 
Um, I just want to remind residents who are watching online, I know there's a lot of questions, a lot of clarity everyone is seeking. Um, and again, I would just urge you to, in addition to asking your questions, visit our uh, gov.nt.ca webpage. We have an entire uh, section dedicated on COVID and all the information about what's in this plan will be there, as well as a very helpful infographic that's been designed um, by our, our some comms teams and the, the folks over at Health to help really understand the, the various phases. So please go and check that out. Um, I'm going to now turn it over to Sydney Cohen with CBC for some questions. Hi, uh, can you hear me okay? You bet. Okay, great. Um, yes, yeah, so I guess uh, with um, you can have more people over now, up to five people in a household, uh, but they still have to, you said they still have to maintain a two meter different uh, distance if possible. So does that mean like, no hugging grandma or you know no touching a romantic partner um it's very hard not to hug grandma but if she's um um in the higher risk category elders are in high risk category we ask you to use your um judgment and common sense you, uh, last thing you want to do is expose grandma depending on activities that you've done prior but um we, um, if these are your dedicated five and your romantic partner is your dedicated partner, at, at some point um, you, you are allowed to hug um, your romantic partner. I will never put an order against that. So, and we will never um, put a complaint against that. So this is the whole point of increasing the household members so that you can actually have your romantic partner in your home. Okay, thank you very much for that. And um, I, as far as, uh, you know, you said that compliance um, will be a big factor in loosening restrictions. Um, what is your assessment of like current, of the compliance right now? And um, as a sort of addendum to that, uh, years, I, we're hoping to get you to say like, if we're on this current path, can, we can reopen by Friday. Is that right? So, but, so my question is kind of in two parts. The, how would you assess compliance right now? And your assessment means that we can reopen on Friday with phase one. We, we, this is an excellent question. We actually have um, an excellent compliance enforcement task force, and we've been able to dashboard um, the complaints and how much and the complaints are successfully closed and investigated, and the vast majority of complaints have been addressed and closed. And with the um, additional uh, order we put into April on April 27th, which we've tightened up the border in terms of essential service workers, and we have a stronger confidence that we have better control of the border than we ever have. And so the Compliance Enforcement Task Force meets on a regular basis, and they're investigating um, every complaint. And so based on their current activity, it should not um, in any shape, form impede the introduction of phase one. I would love to have phase one started as early as um, Friday, May 15th, because that's full two incubation periods from a last negative swap. And that's the path we're headed. It We do need um, legal, um, amendment of the order, which we're in the process of doing. And so we could, in all essence, be ready to open as early as Friday, May 15th. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sydney. Um, Mo, Vista Radio, are you on the line? Uh, this is Greg from Vista. Mo actually had a family emergency, so he asked me to step in. All right, go ahead and ask some questions. Perfect. Um, just one quick one for you. Um, with the implemented implementation, excuse me, of phase one, uh, are you planning on, on having it as one big implementation all at once, or is it going to be uh, it, it kind of grouped up within mid to late May? Thank you. So in the Emerging Wisely document, in the back you have an addendum, and then you have um, all the activities in phase one. These activities are activities we have approved that can occur in phase one. How they get implemented, how what time they get implemented really depends on 
the ability for the businesses, the organizers, whoever implemented the activities to do the risk assessments, to um, restructure their workflows and their businesses to meet these um, enhanced measures. And if they meet them, then they can start. But what I do recognize is this can occur at different times um, within phase one, or they may not be able to do it until a later date. So it is, it's in the hands of both um, the businesses and those who organize activities and their ability to do um, what's required of them to reduce their risk. Thank you. Did you, did you have a follow-up question or was that all? Oh, that's all, thank you. Okay, great. Um, I have another online question. I've seen a couple of these, so we'll ask that next. Um, will businesses need to provide a reopening plan? Can we address that? Okay. Yeah, so Carrie, I think you're on the line. We'll get you to answer that one for us if you don't mind. Well, gee, thanks. <laughs> um, yeah, so as part of the reopening of businesses, um, it's a requirement that they conduct a exposure control plan and put mitigation measures in place. Um, these mitigation measures will be assessed by inspectors um, and any businesses that are requiring additional assistance filling out the control plans can contact the WSCC um, and our inspectors will work with you to put those plans in place and ensure you have everything you need to be able to open effectively um, and protect the workers and the public. Thanks, Carrie. And just for those who will likely ask this question next, do we have a time frame if I submit my plan kind of from submitting a plan to reopening of business? Is there a time frame in there? So for the time frame to be able to reopen from the time you have the control plan in place, sometimes depends on the controls that you're wanting to implement. Um, if you're wanting to implement engineering controls where you have to build barricades or um, create barriers for the public um, may take a little bit more time, but essentially we're trying to work with you to put things in place to be able to get you up and running as quickly as possible. Perfect, thank you, Carrie. I'm gonna turn it over now to Paul Bickford, Hay River Hub. Okay, thank you very much. Um, this is a question for Dr. Candola. Uh, Dr. Candola, could you explain why uh, the dine-in portions of restaurants are not included in this uh, first phase? I'm sort of surprised that uh, schools are, are opening or, or can be opening. Uh, it seems to me like dine-in portions of restaurants would be a lot less complicated to do. Thank you, Paul. The dining um, portion of restaurants will be open in phase two. When we, we're looking at um, indoor gatherings, uh, we've moved it to um, phase two. When you look specifically at schools, what we know from the epidemiology, not only in Canada, but the rest of the world, that um, children less than or equal to 19 only contribute to 5% of um, COVID cases in Canada. Um, in terms of the over 3,000 hospitalizations, only about um, 32 have been in uh, children less than equal to 19, and two in the ICU, and those were in infants less than 12 months. And there's been no mortality um, in this age group in Canada. Um, across the world, in kids less than 10, they've really seen minimal symptoms. So this is not... Um, they don't feel that children are driving the COVID um, severity or the, the outbreaks. What you are seeing is large scale outbreaks in long term care facilities, high risk population. We're seeing um, a significant hospitalization of adults, um, in um, middle aged adults, and, and about 95% of deaths in Canada have been people over age 60. So, with children, um, it's not the same scenario as indoor gatherings involving adults or indoor gatherings involving non-essential workers. So this is why we phased in schools early and phased in anything that could involve adults and indoor gatherings later in phase two. Okay, my follow-up to that would be, 
would that be the message that you would give to parents who might be um, hesitant, nervous, worried about sending their uh, kids back to school uh, at this time? Absolutely. One of the um, scenarios that parents, and I'm, I'm going to ask um, the um, NWT as a whole, um, if, if we were to be 100% safe, I wanted to stay in containment. We could be in containment for the next 18 months to three years. Uh, are we as a society prepared to stay in absolute containment, locked down in our house for the next two to three years while we wait for the vaccine? I, I agree. I would think most people say, no, we're not prepared to do that. Then we need to prepare when we, op we open up this uh, society if we need to prepare to take risk and we need to look at that measured risk and develop it in phases. Um, Parents will be um, expected at some point to return to work. Um, children can't be at home forever during this period. They can't be at home in the summer. I, we've done a risk assessment and we feel that with the right mitigation measures, kids are safe to go back to school. And they're safer now to go back to school in the spring than any other time um, because we have tight border security. We have no community transmission. We are in a very enviable state compared to other countries that have reopened their schools because we can safely say to the parents, we've done 2,000 tests. We have no indication that this community transmission happening. We've kept such tight control of the border that we're monitoring everyone coming in and we know who they are and they're reporting to us and we can pick it up quickly and isolate. Um, I can't provide any other safer, secure messages to parents, including myself, who is very eager to have her 12-year-old son go back to grade six. Believe me. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. We're going to uh, turn it now to Thomas Fabio Taiga. Are you on the line? All right, I see he's there, but maybe he's just having a, some technical difficulties or forgetting the mute button. So we'll just quickly turn it over then to John at CBC. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I want to talk a little bit about phase two. Um, phase two will be reached when there's limited or no community spread, uh, no imported uh, cases um, with limited or uh, with you know, with no strain on the health system. So are we not already in this stage? So it's, um, this is Dr. Condola. We, we're, we've been in containment stage and we've looked at public health measures in terms of easing. So what we do is we take the low line fruit, we ease the public health measures where we don't anticipate a high risk we don't throw everything into the same, um, you know, uh, phase where there's high risk and low risk. We start with low risk. We don't anticipate um, community transmission, and then we monitor. We monitor two full incubation um, periods. Have uh, been the, able to have 25 people outdoors. Has that led to anything? Um, some of the um, businesses opening. Um, were they able to implement their measures? Are we, have we been able to? not see any community transmission or pick up cases where they can't relate it to travel. Uh, if we can do that um, over a four week period and do it safely, then the one thing that COVID loves, COVID loves close prolonged um, contact with as many people as possible in an indoor location. So I'm not gonna jump to that right away because I, do, I have to work with the brain of a COVID. It's almost like profiling COVID-19. So we, we, we give, we um, outdoors, um, lots of space, limited spread, um, indoors one-on-one -on -one with um, um, appropriate mitigation measures, limited spread. Then we will move on to these um, higher risk indoor gatherings with mitigation measures to decrease spread, but we're not prepared to do that off the bat first. Did you have a follow-up question, John? Yes, please. Um, when putting together this plan, how did you strike that balance between restarting the economy and people's health? 
How did you take that into consideration? So the, the whole plan of phase one was the whole point of restarting the economy. Um, in containment phase, what you've noticed when we looked at businesses, um, we um, said essential businesses like uh, retail pharmacies, they could continue because they provide essential service and then non-essential businesses that can uh, maintain physical distancing, um, they could go ahead. The third category um, in phase one was uh, non-essential businesses that could not maintain physical distancing. We have opened pretty much all types of businesses when you take that approach, allowing them um, with appropriate risk mitigation measures to um, now open up. So I'm talking about um, the um, personal service establishments, the massage therapists, the chiropractitioners, they, they are now um, able to restart business. And then this, the other scenario that we had to look at is like gym and fitness centers. Um, we know um, there's a lot of indoor activity happening in gyms. That would be more related to phase two. But however, we said, how can we um, reinvigorate this um, critical, this gym and fitness um, center component of our uh, business sector in a way that they can still start up. So by allowing um, 25 people outside, they can still do outdoor classes, can still do running clubs, they can still do fitness classes out, outdoors. At the same time, they can do one-on-one -on -one personal training indoors so that we can reopen them to, that, to the point that in phase two, they can open up more. So when you look at our um, strategy, we have um, tried to address as many businesses as possible in phase one and phase two, as well as other activities as well, such as faith-based gatherings, community gatherings, um, summer camps. These are like all components of our society that we do want to open, but we want to open it with that balance of not having um, opening the doors to COVID spread where it then overwhelms the healthcare system. Thanks, John. All right, we're going to give Thomas another go here, see if his mic is working from Radio Taiga. Okay, keep trying that mic and we're going to uh, <laughs> ask another theme question here that I keep seeing online. Um, so maybe Dr. Kendall and maybe Minister Tom can speak to that as well. Um, this is that question we continue to get asked about dental offices. Is there a, any is there any indication of dental offices in the, in the plan? Will dentists from down south be able to come up here if uh, if those are opened? Can somebody respond to that? So with the the dental offices, we have it in um, for in the plan that they're um, open for emergency services. Uh, dental offices um, here are, are high risk activity. They involve. Um, um, oral procedures, um, suctioning, um, higher risk of aerosolization. They need a different type of personal protective equipment, which is N95s. They're, they're a high risk, not only to the employee, but also to the client. And so there, we are working closely with um, an NWT Dental Association in um, adopting um, an infection prevention control standard that would be adequate to protect the public and the dentist. When it comes to any essential workers coming um, from the south, um, they go. They can go for Protect NWT, and we do workplace risk assessments. So, if it's um, an emergency, uh, right now dentists are emergency services. So, if it's a scenario where um, essential workers require for emergency services, then they will get an exemption, and we will look at that um, scenario, and they would have to wear the appropriate personal protective equipment. So. Those specific requests can always go for Protect NWT, and we are working closely with the NWT Dental Association to, um, as we move them into opening up to elective um, appointments in phase two. All right, thank you. Um, the other theme we're also seeing is this question for clarification around if I live in another jurisdiction, but my significant other lives in the territory, does this mean that I will now be able to come to stay with my significant other? So with the, um, the border restrictions, the focus is on protecting the health of NWT. Um, the exemptions have been for workers that we require uh, for the critical functioning of our, um, 
for NWT that we've allowed them to come. There's been compassion exemptions where people are struggling um, with uh, terminal illness where we've um, ex had exemptions allowing people to come. But right now it's, it's non-essential travel. What we would recommend uh, for people who are in um, um, across the border relationships is to visit them and just uh, when they come back to be aware that they need to do mandatory 14 day self isolation. The focus right now is about trying to decrease as much as possible the introduction of COVID into NWT. The fact that we can relax all these measures, the fact that you can now um, get a registered, um, a massage where you register a massage therapist or go see um, your car practitioner or get your hair done or go to school. All these measures, the fact that we can relax them is the fact that we are in containment mode. So there's that balance that if we start increasing and introducing more travel related risk and there's breaches, then um, we, we can in some cases have to relook at these um, more relaxing public health measures. It's the fine line. Um, I would wish um, as much as possible to not have border restrictions and I would wish and pray that the rest of Canada could be the same as NWT and get to a point where they don't have community transmission, where Canada is um, risk-free and then we can definitely drop the travel restrictions. This is what I hope and this is what I'm looking for. But at this point, we're opening up so much freedom in NWT based on the ability to restrict risk. And that's where I'm at in phase one. Okay, thank you. All right, I don't think we're going to get uh, Radio Tega's mic working, but we'll get an emailed question. Uh, so if you can hear me, Thomas, feel free to email me questions and we'll get those answered for you. Um, that kind of brings us actually to the, the end of our hour here. So thank you to everybody who's watched online and asked your questions. Again, I, I'm seeing a lot of themes here. Um, you know, our friends at Cabin Radio as well as CBC will inevitably be kind of compiling this information and posting some stuff there for you. So that's great. We will also be posting information to the Cabinet Comms Facebook page and the Gov website. So please make sure you're referencing that. Um, and for media, any follow up questions, always uh, you just email press secretary at gov.nt.ca. So I'd like to thank um, Premier of the Northwest Territories, Carolyn Cochran, uh, Minister of Health and Social Services, Diane Tom, our Chief Public Health Officer, Dr. Cami Candola, and uh, Carrie Ingram, Chief Inspector of Mines and Operational he Operation Health and Safety for the Workers' Safety and Compensation Commission for calling in and answering those questions. Um, we look forward to letting you all know when phase one will start and we'll be sure to make sure that uh, the details for that phase one are very clear in the communication that goes out so you're all aware of what you are permitted to do. So thank you again to everybody and have a wonderful afternoon.